Chapter Forty Seven of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Forty Seven. I am sent away after prizes and meet with a hurricane am driven on shore with the loss of more than half my men. Where is the rattlesnake? In three weeks we were again ready for sea, and the admiral ordered us to our old station off Martinique. We had cruised about a fortnight off St. Pierre's, and, as I walked the deck at night, often did I look at the sights in the town and wonder whether any of them were in the presence of Celeste. When, one evening being about six miles off shore we observed two vessels rounding negro point close in shore it was quite calm and the boats were towing ahead it will be dark in half an hour peter said o'brien and i think we might get them before they anchor or if they do anchor it will be well outside what do you think i agreed with him for in fact i always seemed to be happier when the brig was close in shore, as I felt I was nearer to Celeste, and the further we were off, the more melancholy I became, continually thinking of her, and the sight of her after so many years' separation had changed my youthful attachment into strong affection. I may say that I was deeply in love. The very idea of going into the harbor, therefore, gave me pleasure and there was no mad or foolish thing that I would not have done, only to gaze upon the walls which contained the constant objects of my thoughts. These were wild and visionary notions, and with little chance of ever arriving at any successful issue. But at one or two and twenty, we are fond of building castles, and very apt to fall in love without considering our prospect of success. I replied that I thought it very possible, and wished he would permit me to make the attempt, as, if I found there was much risk, I would return. "'I know that I can trust you, Peter,' said O'Brien, "'and it's a great pleasure to know that you have an officer you can trust. But haven't I brought you up myself, made a man of you as I promised I would, when you were a little spalpleen, with a sniffling nose?' and legs in the shape of two carrots. So hoist out the launch, and get the boats ready. The sooner the better. What a hot day this has been. Not a cat's paw on the water, and the sky all of a mist. Only look at the sun, how he goes down, puffed out to three times his size, as if he were in a terrible passion. I suspect we shall have the land breeze off strong. In half an hour I shoved off with the boats. It was now quite dark, and I pulled towards the harbour of St. Pierre. The heat was excessive and unaccountable. Not the slightest breadth of wind moved in the heavens or below. No cloud to be seen, and the stars were obscured by a sort of mist. There appeared a total stagnation of the elements. The men in the boats pulled off their jackets, for, after a moment's pulling, they could bear them no longer. As we pulled in, the atmosphere became more opaque, and the darkness more intense. We supposed ourselves to be at the mouth of the harbor, but could see nothing, not three yards ahead of the boat. Swinburne, who always went with me, was steering the boat, and I observed to him the unusual appearance of the night. "'I've been watching it, sir,' replied Swinburne. "'And I tell you, Mr. Simple, that if we only knew how to find the brig, "'that I would advise you to get on board of her immediately. "'She'll want all her hands this night, or I'm much mistaken.' "'Why do you say so?' replied I. "'Because I think, nay, I may say that I'm certain, "'we'll have a hurricane afore morning. It's not the first time I've cruised in these latitudes. I recollect in 1794. But I interrupted him. 
Swinburne, I believe that you are right. At all events, I'll turn back. Perhaps we may reach the brig before it comes on. She carries a light, and we can find her out. I then turned the boat around and steered, as near as I could guess, for where the brig was lying. But we had not pulled out more than two minutes before a low moaning was heard in the atmosphere. Now here, now there, and we appeared to be pulling through solid darkness, if I may use the expression. Swinburne looked around him and pointed out on the starboard bow. It's a coming, Mr. Simple, sure enough. Many's the living being that will not rise on its legs tomorrow. See, sir? I looked, and dark as it was, it appeared as if a sort of black wall was sweeping along the water right towards us. The moaning gradually increased to a stunning roar, and then at once it broke upon us with a noise to which no thunder can bear a comparison. The sea was perfectly level, but boiling and covered with a white foam, so that we appeared to in the night to be floating on milk. The oars were caught by the wind with such force that the men were dashed forward under the thwarts, and many of them severely hurt. Fortunately, we pulled with tholes and pins, or the gunwale and planks of the boats would have been wrenched off, and we should have foundered. The wind soon caught the boat on her broadside, and, had there been the least sea, would have inevitably thrown her over. But Swinburne put the helm down, and she fell off before the hurricane, darting through the boiling water at the rate of ten miles an hour. All hands were aghast. They had recovered their seats, but were obliged to relinquish them and sit down at the bottom, holding on by the thwarts. The terrific roaring of the hurricane prevented any communication except by gesture. The other boats had disappeared. Lighter than ours, they had flown away faster before the sweeping element. But we had not been a minute before the wind, before the sea rose in a most unaccountable manner. It appeared to be by magic. Of all the horrors that I ever witnessed, nothing could be compared to the scenes of this night. We could see nothing, and heard only the wind, before which we were darting like an arrow, to where we knew not, unless it was to certain death. Swinburne steered the boat, every now and then looking back as the waves increased. In a few minutes we were in a heavy swell that at one minute bore us all aloft and at the next almost sheltered us from the hurricane. And now the atmosphere was charged with showers of spray, the wind cutting off the summits of the waves as if with a knife and carrying them along with it as if it were in its arms. The boat was filling with water and appeared to settle down fast. The men bailed with their hats in silence when a large wave culminated over the stern, filling us to the thwarts. The next moment we all received a shock so violent that we were jerked from our seats. Swinburne was thrown over my head. Every timber of the boat separated at once, and she appeared to crumble from under us, leaving us floating on the raging waters. We all struck out for our lives, but with little hope of preserving them. But the next wave dashed us on the rocks, against which the boat had already been hurled. That wave gave life to some, and death to others. Me, in heaven's mercy, it preserved. I was thrown so high up that I merely scraped against the top of the rock, breaking two of my ribs. Swinburne and eight more escaped with me, but not unhurt. Two had their legs broken, three had broken arms, and the others were more or less contused. Swinburne miraculously received no injury. We had been eighteen in the boat, of which ten escaped. The others were hurled up at our feet, and the next morning we found them dreadfully mangled. One or two had their skulls literally shattered to pieces against the rocks. I felt that I was saved, and was grateful. But, 
Still the hurricane howled. Still the waves were washing over us. I crawled further up upon the beach and found Swinburne sitting down with his eyes directed seaward. He knew me, took my hand, squeezed it, and then held it in his. For some moments we remained in this position, when the waves, which every moment increased in volume, washed up to us and obliged us to crawl further up. I then looked around me. The hurricane continued in its fury, but the atmosphere was not so dark. I could trace, for some distance, the line of the harbor from the ridge of foam upon the shore, and for the first time I thought of O'Brien and the brig. I put my mouth close to Swinburne's ear and cried out, O'Brien! Swinburne shook his head and looked up again at the offing. I thought whether there was any chance of the brig's escape. She was certainly six, if not seven miles off, and the hurricane was not direct on the shore. She might have a drift of ten miles, perhaps, but what was that against such tremendous power? I prayed for those on board of the brig, and returned thanks for my own preservation. I was, or soon should be, a prisoner, no doubt, but what was that? I thought of Celeste, and felt almost happy. In about three hours the force of the wind subsided. It still blew a heavy gale, but the sky cleared up, and the stars again twinkled in the heavens, and we could see to a considerable distance. "'It's breaking now, sir,' said Swinburne at last. "'Satisfied with the injury it has done, and that's no little. This is worse than ninety-four. Now I'd give all my pay and prize money if it were only daylight and I could know the fate of the poor rattlesnake.' What do you think, Swinburne? All depends on whether they were taken unprepared, sir. Captain O'Brien is as good a seaman as ever trod a plank, but he never has been in a hurricane, and may not have known the signs and warnings which God, in his mercy, has vouchsafed unto us. Your flush vessels fill easily, but we must hope for the best. Most anxiously did we look out for the day, which appeared to us as if it would never break. At last the dawn appeared, and we stretched our eyes to every part of the offing as it was lighted up, but we could not see the brig. The sun rose, and all was bright and clear, but we looked not around us. Our eyes were directed to where we had left the brig. The sea was still running high, but the wind abated fast. "'Thank God!' ejaculated Swinburne, when he had directed his eyes along the coast. "'She is above water at all events.' And, looking in the direction where he pointed, I perceived the brig within two miles of the shore, dismantled and tossing in the waves. "'I see her,' replied I, catching my breath with joy. "'But still,' I think she must go on shore. All depends on whether she can get a little bit of sail up to weather the point, replied Swinburne. And depend upon it, Captain O'Brien knows that as well as we do. We were now joined by the other men who were saved. We all shook hands. They pointed out to me the bodies of our shipmates who had perished. I directed them to haul them further up and put them all together, and continued with Swinburne to watch the brig. In about half an hour we perceived a triangle raised, and, in ten minutes afterwards, a jury-mast aft. The trysail was hoisted and set. Then the shears were seen forward, and, in as short a time, another trysail and a storm-jib were expanded to the wind. "'That's all he can do now, Mr. Simple,' observed Swinburne. "'He must trust to them and to Providence. "'They are not more than a mile from the beach. "'It will be touch and go.' "'Anxiously did we watch for more than half an hour. "'The other men returned to us and joined in our speculations. "'At one time we thought it impossible. 
At another we were certain that she would weather the point. At last she neared it. She forged ahead. My anxiety became almost insupportable. I stood first on one leg and then on the other, breathless with suspense. She appeared to be on the point, actually touching the rocks. God, she struck, said I. No, replied Swinburne, and then we saw her pass on the other side of the outermost rock and disappear. Safe, Mr. Simple, weathered by God, cried Swinburne, waving his hat with joy. God be thanked replied I, overcome with delight. End of chapter 47、Chapter、48 of Peter Simple This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter 48 The Devastations of the Hurricane. Peter Makes Friends at Destroying or Saving Nothing Like British Seamen. Peter Meets with General O'Brien, much to his satisfaction. Has another meeting, still more so. A great deal of pressing of hands, and all that, as Pope says. Now that the brig was safe, we thought of ourselves. My first attention was directed to the dead bodies, and as I looked at their mangled limbs, I felt grateful to heaven that I had been so miraculously spared. We then cast our eyes along the beach to see if we could trace any remnants of the other boats, but in vain. We were about three miles from the town, which we could perceive had received considerable damage, and the beach below it was strewn with wrecks and fragments. I told the men that we might as well walk into town and deliver ourselves up as prisoners, to which they agreed, and we set forward promising to send for the poor fellows who were too much hurt to accompany us. As soon as we climbed up the rocks and gained the inland, what a sight presented itself to us. Trees torn up by the roots in every direction. Cattle lying dead. Here and there the remains of a house of which the other parts had been swept away for miles. Everything not built of solid masonry, had disappeared. We passed what had been a range of negro huts, but they were leveled to the ground. The negroes were busily searching for their property among the ruins, while the women held their infants in their arms and the other children by their sides. Here and there was the mother, wailing over the dead body of some poor little thing which had been crushed to death they took no notice of us about half a mile further on to our great delight we fell in with the crews of the other boats who were sitting by the side of the road they had all escaped unhurt their boats being so much more buoyant than ours had been thrown up high and dry they joined us and we proceeded on our way on our road we fell in with a cart blown over under the wheel of which was the leg of the negro who conducted it we released the poor fellow his leg was fractured we laid him by the side of the road in the shade and continued our march our whole route was one scene of desolation and distress but when we arrived at the town, we found that there it was indeed accumulated. There was not one house in three standing entire. The beach was covered with the remnants of bodies and fragments of vessels, whose masts 
lay forced several feet into the sand and broken into four or five pieces parties of soldiers were busy taking away the bodies and removing what few valuables had been saved we turned up into the town for no one accosted us or even noticed us and here the scene was even more dreadful in some streets they were digging out those who were still alive and whose cries were heard among the ruins in others they were carrying away the dead bodies the lamentations of the relatives the howling of the negroes the cries of the wounded the cursing and swearing of the french soldiers and the orders delivered continually by officers on horseback with all the confusion arising from the crowds of spectators mingling their voices together formed a scene as dreadful as it was novel after surveying it for a few minutes i went up to an officer on horseback and told him in french that i wished to surrender myself as a prisoner we have no time to take prisoners now he replied hundreds are buried in the ruins and we must try to save them we must now attend to the claims of humanity will you allow my men to assist you sir replied i they are active and strong fellows sir he said taking off his hat i thank you in the name of my unfortunate countrymen show us then where we may be most useful he turned and pointed to a house higher up the offices of which were blown down there are living beings under those ruins come my lads said i and sore as they were my men hastened with alacrity to perform their task i could not help them myself my side was so painful but i stood by giving them directions in half an hour we had cleared away so as to arrive at a poor negro girl whose cries we had distinctly heard we released her and laid her down in the street but she fainted her left hand was dreadfully shattered i was giving what assistance i could and all the men were busy clearing away throwing on one side the beams and rafters when an officer on horseback rode up he stood and asked me who we were i told him that we belonged to the brig and had been wrecked and that we were giving what assistance we could until they were at leisure to send us to prison you english are fine brave fellows replied he as he rode on another unfortunate object had been recovered by our men an old white-headed negro but he was too much mangled to live we brought him out and were laying him beside the negro girl when several officers on horseback rode down the street the one who was foremost in a general's uniform i immediately recognized as my former friend then colonel o'brien they all stopped and looked at us i told who we were general o'brien took off his hat to the sailors and thanked them he did not recognize me and he was passing on when i said to him in english general o'brien you have forgotten me but i shall never forget your kindness my god said he is it you my dear fellow and he sprang from his horse and shook me warmly by the hand no wonder that i did not know you you are a very different person from little peter simple who dressed up as a girl and danced on stilts but i have to thank you and so has celeste for your kindness to her i will not ask you to leave your work of charity and kindness but when you have done what you can come up to my house any one will show it to you and if you do not find me you will find celeste as you must be aware i cannot leave this melancholy employment god bless you 
he then rode off followed by his staff come my lads said i depend upon it we shall not be very cruelly treated let us work hard and do all the good we can and the frenchmen won't forget it we had cleared that house and went back to where the other people were working under the orders of the officer on horseback i went up to him and told him we had saved two and if he had no objection we would assist his party he thankfully accepted our services and now my lads said swedberg let us forget all our bruises and show these french fellows how to work and they did so they tossed away the beams and rafters right and left with a quickness and dexterity which quite astonished the officer and other inhabitants who were looking on and in half an hour had done more work than could have possibly been expected several lives were saved and the french expressed their admiration at our sailors conduct and brought them something to drink which they stood much in need of poor fellows after they had worked double tides as we say and certainly were the means of saving many lives which otherwise would have been sacrificed the disasters occasioned by this hurricane were very great owing to its having taken place at night when the chief of the inhabitants were in bed and asleep i was told that most of the wood houses were down five minutes after the hurricane burst upon them about noon there was no more work for us to do and i was not sorry that it was over my side was very painful and the burning heat of the sun made me feel giddy and sick at my stomach i inquired of a respectable-looking old frenchman which was the general's house he directed me to it and i proceeded there followed by my men when i arrived i found the orderly leading away the horse of general o'brien who had just returned i desired a sergeant who was in attendance at the door to acquaint the general that i was below he returned and desired me to follow him i was conducted into a large room where i found him in company with several officers he again greeted me warmly and introduced me to the company as the officer who had permitted the ladies who had been taken prisoners to come on shore i have to thank you then for my wife said an officer coming up and offering his hand another came up and told me i had also released his we then entered into a conversation in which i stated the occasion of my having been wrecked and all the particulars also that i had seen the brig in the morning dismasted but that she had weathered the point and was safe that brig of yours i must pay you the compliment to say has been very troublesome and my namesake keeps the batteries more upon the alert than ever i could have done said general o'brien i don't believe there is a negro five years old upon the island who does not know your brig we then talked over the attack of the privateer in which we were beaten off ah replied the aide-de-camp you made a mess of that he has been gone these four months captain carnot swears that he'll fight you if he falls in with you he has kept his word replied i and then i narrated our action with the three french privateers and the capture of the vessel which surprised and i think annoyed them very much well my friend said general o'brien you must stay with me while you are on the island if you want anything let me know i am afraid that i want a surgeon replied i for my side is so painful that i can scarcely breathe are you hurt then said general o'brien with an anxious look not dangerously i believe said i but rather painfully 
let me see said an officer who stepped forward i am surgeon to the forces here and perhaps you will trust yourself in my hands take off your coat i did so with difficulty you have two ribs broken said he feeling my side and a very severe contusion you must go to bed or lie on a sofa for a few days in a quarter of an hour i will come and dress you and promise you to make you all well in ten days in return for having given me my daughter who was on board of the victorine with the other ladies the officers now made their bows and left me alone with general o'brien recollect said he that i tell you once for all that my purse and everything is at your command if you do not accept them freely i shall think you do not love us it is not the first time peter and you repaid me honorably however of course i was no party to that affair it was celeste's doing continued he laughing of course i could not imagine that it was you who was dressed up as a woman and so impudently dashed through france on stilts but i must hear all your adventures by and by celeste is most anxious to see you will you go now or wait till after the surgeon comes oh now if you please general may i first beg that some care may be taken of my poor men they have had nothing to eat since yesterday and are very much bruised and have worked hard and that a cart may be sent for those who lie on the beach i should have thought of them before replied he and i will also order the same party to bury the other poor fellows who are lying on the beach come now i will take you to celeste End of chapter forty eight Chapter forty nine of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Fajardo. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter forty nine. Broken ribs are not likely to produce broken hearts. O'Brien makes something like a declaration of peace. Peter Simple actually makes a declaration of love. Rash proceedings on all sides. I followed the general into a handsomely furnished apartment, where I found Celeste waiting to receive me. She ran to me as soon as I entered, and with what pleasure did I take her hand and look on her beautiful expressive countenance i could not say a word and neither did celeste for a minute i held her hand in mine looking at her the general stood by regarding us alternately he then turned round and walked to the window i lifted the hand to my lips and then released it it appears to be a dream almost said celeste i could not make any reply but continued to gaze upon her she had grown up into such a beautiful creature her figure was perfect and the expression of her countenance was so varied so full of intellect and feeling it was angelic her eyes suffused with tears beamed so softly so kindly on me I could have fallen down and worshipped her. Come, said General O'Brien. Come, my dear friend. Now that you have seen Celeste, the surgeon must see you. The surgeon? cried Celeste with alarm. Yes, my love, it is of no consequence. Only a couple of ribs broken. I followed General O'Brien out of the room, and as I came to the door, I turned round to look at Celeste. She had retreated to the sofa, and her handkerchief was up to her eyes. 
The surgeon was waiting for me. He bandaged me and applied some cooling lotion to my side, which made me feel quite comfortable. I must now leave you, said General O'Brien. You had better lie down for an hour or two, and then, if I am not back, you know your way to Celeste. I laid down as he requested, but, as soon as I heard the clatter of the horse's hoofs as he rode off, I left the room and hurried to the drawing-room. Celeste was there, and hastened to inquire if I was much hurt. I replied in the negative, and told her that I had come down to prove it to her. We then sat down on the sofa together. I have the misfortune never to appear before you, Celeste, except in a very unprepoposing state. When you first saw me, I was wounded. At our next meeting, I was in woman's clothes. The last time we met, I was covered with dirt and gunpowder. And now I return to you, wounded and in, in rags. I wonder whether I shall ever appear before you as a gentleman. It is not the clothes which make the gentleman, Peter. I am too happy to see you think of how you are dressed. I have never yet thanked you for your kindness to us when we last met. My father will never forget it. Nor have I thanked you, Celeste, for your kindness in dropping the purse into the hat when you met me trying to escape from France. I have never forgotten you, and, since we met the last time, you have hardly ever been out of my thoughts. You don't know how thankful I am to the hurricane for having blown me into your presence. When we cruised in the brig, I have often examined the town with my glass, trying to fancy that I had my eye upon the house you were in, and have felt so happy when we were close in shore, because I knew that I was nearer to you. And Peter... I am sure I have often watched the brig, and have been so glad to see it come nearer, and then so afraid that the batteries would fire at you. What a pity it is that my father and you should be opposed to each other. We might be so happy. And may be yet, Celeste, replied I. We conversed for two hours, which appeared to be but ten minutes. I felt that I was in love but I do not think that Celeste had any idea at the time that she was. But I leave the reader to judge, from the little conversation I have quoted, whether she was not, or something very much approaching to it. The next morning I went out early to look for the brig, and, to my great delight, saw her about six miles off the harbor's mouth, standing in for the land. She had now got up very respectable jury masts, with top gallants for top sails, and appeared to be well under command. When she was within three miles of the harbor, she lowered the jolly boat, the only one she had left, and it pulled in shore, with a flag of truce hoisted at the bows. I immediately returned to my room, and wrote a detailed account of what had taken place, ready to send to O'Brien when the boat returned and I, of course, requested him to send me my effects, as I had nothing but what I stood in. I had just completed my letter when General O'Brien came in. My dear friend, said he, I have just received a flag of truce from Captain O'Brien, requesting to know the fate of his boat's crews, and permission to send in return the clothes and effects of the survivors. I have written down the whole circumstances for him, and made the same request to him, replied I, and I handed him my letter. He read it over, and returned it. But, my dear lad, you must think very poorly of us Frenchmen, if you imagine that we intend to detain you here as a prisoner. In the first place, your liberation of so many French subjects, when you captured the Victorine, would entitle you to a similar act of kindness. And in the next place, you have not been fairly captured, but by a visitation of Providence, which, by the means of the late storm, must destroy all natural antipathies, 
and promote that universal philanthropy between all men which your brave fellows proved that they possess. You are, therefore, free to depart with all your men, and we shall still hold ourselves your debtors. How is your side today? Oh, very bad indeed, replied I, for I could not bear the idea of returning to the brig so soon, for I had been obliged to quit Celeste very soon after dinner the day before, and go to bed. I had not yet had much conversation with her, nor had I told General O'Brien how it was that we escaped from France. I don't think I can possibly go on board today, but I feel very grateful to you for your kindness. Well, well, replied the General, who observed my feelings. I do not think it necessary that you should go on board today. I will send the men and your letter, and I will write to Captain O'Brien to say that you are in bed and will not bear moving until the day after tomorrow. Will that do? I thought it but a very short time, but I saw that the general looked as if he expected me to consent. So I did. The boat can come and return again with some of your clothes, continued the general, and I will tell Captain O'Brien that if he comes off the mouth of the harbor the day after tomorrow, I will send you on board in one of our boats. He then took my letter and quitted the room. As soon as he was gone, I found myself quite well enough to go to Celeste, who waited for me, and I told her what had passed. That morning I sat with her in the general and narrated all my adventures, which amused the general very much. I did not conceal the conduct of my uncle, and the hopes which I faintly entertained of being able, some day or another, to discover the fraud which had been practiced, or how very unfavorable were my future prospects if I did not succeed. At this portion of my narrative, the general appeared very thoughtful and grave. When I had finished, it was near dinner time and I found that my clothes had arrived with a letter from O'Brien, who stated how miserable he had been at the supposition of my loss and his delight at my escape. He stated that on going down into the cabin after I had shoved off, he by chance cast his eyes on the barometer, and, to his surprise, found that it had fallen two inches, which he had been told was the case previous to a hurricane. This combined with a peculiar state of the atmosphere, had induced him to make every preparation, and that they had just completed their work when it came on. The brig was thrown on her beam ends, and lay there for half an hour, when they were forced to cut away the masts to right her. That they did not weather the point the next morning by more than half a cable's length, and concluded by saying, that the idea of my death had made him so unhappy that, if it had not been for the sake of the men, it was almost a matter of indifference to him whether he had been lost or not. He had written to General O'Brien, thanking him for his kindness, and that, if fifty vessels should pass the brig, he would not capture one of them until I was on board again, even if he were dismissed the service for neglect of duty. He said that the brig sailed almost as fast under jury masts as she did before, and that, as soon as I came on board, he should go back to Barbados. As for your ribs being so bad, Peter, that's all bother, continued he. I know that you are making arrangements for another sort of rib as soon as you can manage it. But you must stop a little, my boy. You shall be a lord yet, as I have always promised you that you should. It's a long lane that has no turning. So, good-bye. When I was alone with Celeste, I showed her O'Brien's letter. I had read the part of it relative to his not intending to make any capture while I was on shore to General O'Brien, who replied that, under such circumstances, he thought he should do right to detain me a little longer. But, said he, O'Brien is a man of honor and is worthy of his name. 
when celeste came to that part of the letter in which o'brien stated that i was looking after another rib and which i had quite forgotten she asked me to explain it for although she could read and speak english very well she had not been sufficiently accustomed to it to comprehend the play upon words i translated and then said indeed celeste i had forgotten that observation of o'brien's or i should not have shown you the letter but he has stated the truth after all your kindness to me how can i help being in love with you and need i add that i should consider it the greatest blessing which heaven could grant me if you could feel so much regard for me as one day to become my wife uh, don't be angry with me for telling you the truth continued i for celeste coloured up as i spoke to her oh no i am not angry with you peter far from it it is very complimentary to me what you have just said i am aware continued i that at present i have little to offer you indeed nothing i am not even such a match as your father might approve of but you know my whole history and what my desires are my dear father loves me peter and he loves you too very much he always did from the hour he saw you he was so pleased with your candor and honesty of character he has often told me so and very often talked of you well celeste tell me may i when far away be permitted to think of you and indulge a hope that some day we may meet never to part again and i took celeste by the hand and put my arm around her waist i don't know what to say replied she i will speak to my father or perhaps you will but i will never marry anybody else if i can help it i drew her close to me and kissed her celeste burst into tears and laid her head upon my shoulder when general bryan came in i did not attempt to move nor did celeste general said i you may think me to blame but i have not been able to conceal what i feel for celeste you may think that i am imprudent and that i am wrong in thus divulging what i ought to have concealed until i was in a situation to warrant my aspiring to your daughter's hand but the short time allowed me to be in her company the fear of losing her and my devoted attachment will i trust plead my excuse the general took one or two turns up and down the room and then replied what says celeste celeste will never do anything to make her father unhappy replied she going up to him and hiding her face in his breast with her arm around his neck the general kissed his daughter and then said i will be frank with you mr simple i do not know any man whom i would prefer to you as son-in-law but there are many considerations which young people are very apt to forget i do not interfere in your attachment which appears to be mutual but at the same time i will have no promise and no engagement you may never meet again however celeste is very young and i shall not put any constraint upon her and at the same time you are equally free if time and circumstances should alter your present feelings i can ask no more my dear sir replied i taking the general by the hand it is candid more than i had any reason to expect i shall now leave you with a contented mind and the hopes of one day claiming celeste shall spur me to exertion now if you please we will drop the subject said the general celeste my dear we have a large party to dinner as you know you had better retire to your room and get ready i have asked all the ladies that you liberated peter and all their husbands and fathers so you will have the pleasure of witnessing how many people you made happy by your gallantry 
Now that Celeste has left the room, Peter, I must beg that, as a man of honor, you do not exact from her any more promises or induce her to tie herself down to you by oaths. Her attachment to you has grown up with her unaccountably, and she is already too fond of you for her peace of mind, should accident or circumstances part you forever. Let us hope for the best, and depend upon it, that it shall be no trifling obstacle which will hinder me from seeing you one day united. I thanked the general with tears. He shook me warmly by the hand as I gave my promise, and we separated. How happy did I feel when I went into my room and sat down to compose my mind and think over what had happened. True, at one moment the thought of my dependent situation threw a damp over my joy, but in the next I was building castles, inventing a discovery of my uncle's plot, fancying myself in possession of the title and property, and laying it at the feet of my dear Celeste. Hope sustained my spirits, and I felt satisfied for the present with the consideration that Celeste returned my love. I decked myself carefully and went down where I found all the company assembled. We had a very pleasant, happy party, and the ladies entreated General O'Brien to detain me as a prisoner. Very kind of them, and I felt very much disposed to join in their request. End of chapter 49「Peter Simple first takes a command, then three West Indiamen, and twenty prisoners. One good turn deserves another. The prisoners endeavor to take him, but are themselves taken in. The next day I was very unhappy. The brig was in the offing, waiting for me to come on board. I pointed her out to Celeste as we were at the window, and her eyes met mine. An hour's conversation could not have said more. General O'Brien showed that he had perfect confidence in me, for he left us together. Celeste, said I, I have promised your father. I know what has passed, interrupted she. He told me everything. How kind he is, but I did not say that I would not bind myself, Celeste. No, but my father made me promise that you should not, that if you attempted, I was immediately to prevent you, and so I shall. Then you shall keep your word, Celeste. Imagine everything that can be said in this. And I kissed her. Don't think me forward, Peter, but I wish you to go away happy, said Celeste, and therefore, in return, imagine all I could say in this. And she returned my salute, kissing my cheek. After this, we had a conversation of two hours, but what lovers say is very silly, except to themselves, and the reader need not be troubled with it. General O'Brien came in and told me the boat was ready. I rose up. I was satisfied with what had passed, and with a firm voice I said, Goodbye, Celeste. God bless you, and followed the general who, with some of his officers, walked down with me to the beach. I thanked the general, who embraced me, 
paid my adieus to the officers and step into the boat in half an hour i was on board of the brig and in o'brien's arms we put the helm up and in a short time the town of st pierre was shot out from my longing sight and we were on our way to barbados that day was passed in the cabin with o'brien giving me a minute detail of all that had passed when we anchored once more in carlisle bay we found that the hurricane had been much more extensive in the windward islands than we had imagined several men of war were lying there having lost one or more of their masts and there was great difficulty in supplying the wants of so many as we arrived the last of course we were last served and there being no boats left in store there was no chance of our being ready for sea under two or three months the joan d'arc schooner privateer was still lying there but had not been fitted out for want of men and the admiral proposed to o'brien that he should man her with a part of his ship's company and send one of his lieutenants out to cruise in her this was gladly assented to by o'brien who came on board and asked me whether i should like to have her which i agreed to as i was quite tired of barbados and fried flying fish i selected two midshipmen swinburne and twenty men and having taken on board provisions and water for three months i received my written instructions from o'brien and made sail we soon discovered that the masts which the american had sold to the schooner were much too large for her she was considerably overmasted and we were obliged to be very careful i stood for trinidad off which island was to be my cruising ground and in three weeks had recaptured three west india men when i found myself so short of hands that i was obliged to return to barbados i had put four hands into the first vessel which with the englishmen prisoners were sufficient and three hands into the two others but i was very much embarrassed with my prisoners who amounted to nearly double my ship's company remaining on board both the midshipmen i had sent away and i consulted with swinburne as to what was best to be done why the fact is mr simple captain o'brien ought to have given us more hands twenty men are little enough for a vessel with a boom mainsail like the one we have here and now we have only ten left but i suppose he did not expect us to be so lucky and it's true enough that he has plenty of work for the ship's company now that he has to turn everything in afresh as for the prisoners i think we had better run close in and give them two of our boats to take them on shore at all events we must be rid of them and not be obliged to have one eye aloft and the other down the hatchway as we must now this advice corresponded with my own ideas and i ran inshore gave them the stern boat and one of the larger ones which held them all and sent them away leaving only one boat for the schooner which was hoisted up on the starboard chest tree it fell a dead calm as we sent away the prisoners we saw them land and disappear over the rocks and thought ourselves well rid of them as they were twenty-two in number most of them spaniards and very stout ferocious-looking fellows 
it continued calm during the whole day much to our annoyance and i was very anxious to get away as soon as i could still i could not help admiring the beauty of the scenery the lofty mountains rising abruptly from the ocean and towering in the clouds reflecting on the smooth water as clear as in a looking-glass every color every tint beautifully distinct the schooner gradually drifted close inshore and we could perceive the rocks at the bottom many fathoms deep not a breath of wind was to be seen on the surface of the water for several miles around although the horizon in the offing showed that there was a smart breeze outside night came on and we still lay becalmed i gave my orders to swinburne who had the first watch and retired to my standing bed-place in the cabin i was dreaming and i hardly need say who was the object of my visions i thought i was in eagle park sitting down with her under one of the large chestnut trees which formed the avenue when i felt my shoulder roughly pushed i started up what's the matter who's that swinburne yes sir on with your clothes immediately as we have work on hand i expect and swinburne left the cabin immediately i heard him calling the other men who were below i knew that swinburne would not give a false alarm in a minute i was on deck where i found he had just arrived and was looking at the stern of the schooner what is that swinburne said i silence sir hark don't you hear them yes i replied the sound of oars exactly sir depend upon it those spaniards have got more help and are coming back to take the vessel they know we have only ten hands on board by this time the men were all on deck i directed swinburne to see all the muskets loaded and ran down for my own sword and pistols the water was so smooth and the silence so profound that swinburne had heard the sound of the oars at a considerable distance fortunate it was that i had such a trusty follower another might have slumbered and the schooner had been boarded and captured without our being prepared when i came on deck again i spoke to the men exhorted them to do their duty and pointed out to them that these cutthroat villains would certainly murder us all if we were taken which i firmly believed would have been the case the men declared that they would sell their lives as dearly as they could we had twenty muskets and the same number of pistols all of which were now loaded our guns were also ready but of no use now that the schooner had not steerage way the boats were in sight about a quarter of a mile astern when swinburne said there's a cat's paw flying along the water mr simple if we could only have a little wind how we would laugh at them but i'm afraid there's no such luck shall we let them know that we are ready let every one of us take two muskets said i when the first boat is under the counter take good aim and discharge into one of the boats then seize the other musket and discharge it at the other boat after that we must trust to our cutlasses and pistols for if they come on there will be no time to load again keep silence all of you the boats now came up full of men but as we remained perfectly quiet they pulled up gently hoping to surprise us fortunately one was a little in advance of the other 
upon which i altered my directions and desired my men to fire their second musket upon the first boat as if we were able to disable her we were an equal match for those in the other when the boat was within six yards of the schooner's counter now said i and all the muskets were discharged at once and my men cheered several of the boats dropped and i was sure we had done great execution but they were laid hold of by the other men who had not been pulling and again the boat advanced to the counter good aim my lads this time cried swinburne the other boat will be alongside as soon as you have fired mr simple the schooner has headway and there's a strong breeze coming up again we discharged our ten muskets into the boat but this time we waited until the bowman had hooked on the plane shear with his boat hook and our fire was very effective i was surprised to find that the other boat was not on board of us but a light breeze had come up and the schooner glided through the water still she was close under our counter and would have been aboard in a minute in the meantime the spaniards who were in the first boat were climbing up the sides and were repulsed by my men with great success the breeze freshened and swinburne ran to the helm i perceived the schooner was going fast through the water and the second boat could hardly hold her own i ran to where the boat hook was fixed on the plane shear and unhooked it the boat fell astern leaving two spaniards clinging to the side who were cut down and they fell into the water hurrah all safe cried swinburne and now to punish them the schooner was now darting along at the rate of five miles with an increasing breeze we stood in for two minutes then tacked and ran for the boats swinburne steered and i continued standing in the bows surrounded by the rest of the men starboard a little swinburne starboard it is steady steady i see the first boat she is close under our bows steady port 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 a little port look out my lads and cut down all who climb up crash went the schooner on to the boat the men in her in vain endeavoring to escape us for a second or two she appeared to right until her further gunwale was borne down under the water she turned up and the schooner went over her sending every soul in her to their account one man clung on to a rope and was towed for a few seconds but a cutlass divided the rope at the gunwale and with a faint shriek he disappeared the other boat was close to us and perceived what we had done they remained with their oars poised all ready to pull so as to evade the schooner we steered for her and the schooner was now running at the rate of seven miles an hour when close under our bows by very dexterously pulling short round with her starboard oars we only struck her with her bow and before she went down many of the spaniards had gained the deck or were clinging to the side of the vessel they fought with desperation but we were too strong for them it was only those who had gained the deck which we had to contend with the others clung for a time and unable to get up the sides one by one dropped into the water and went astern in a minute those on deck were lying at our feet and in a minute more they were tossed overboard after their companions not however until one of them struck me through the calf of the leg with his knife as we were lifting him over the gunwale 
i do not mean to say that the spaniards were not justified in attempting to take the schooner but still as we had liberated them but a few hours before we felt that it was unhandsome and treacherous on their part and therefore showed them no quarter there were two of my men wounded as well as myself but not severely which was fortunate as we had no surgeon on board and only about half a yard of diaculum plaster in the vessel well out of that sir said swinburne as i limped aft by the lord harry it must have been a pretty go having shaped our course for barbados i dressed my leg and went down to sleep this time i did not dream of celeste but fought the spaniard over again thought i was wounded and awoke with the pain of my leg End of chapter 50、Chapter、51 Recording by Shasta. Oakland, California. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter fifty one. Peter turned out of his command by his vessel turning bottoms up. A cruise on a main boom with sharks and attendant, self and crew with several flying fish taken. On board a negro boat, Peter regenerates by putting on a new outward man. We made Barbados without any further adventure, and were about ten miles off the bay, steering with a very light breeze, and I went down into the cabin, expecting to be at anchor before breakfast the next morning. It was just daylight. When I found myself thrown out of my bed place on the deck on the other side of the cabin and heard the rushing of water, I sprang up. I knew the schooner was on her beam ends and gained the deck. I was correct in my supposition. She had been upset by what is called a white squall and in two minutes would be down. All the men were up on deck, some dressed, others, like myself, in their shirts. Swinburne was aft. He had an axe in his hand, cutting away the rigging of the main boom. I saw what he was about. I seized another and disengaged the jaw rope and small gear about the mast. We had no other chance. Our boat was under the water. Being hoisted up on the side to leeward. All this, however, was but the work of two minutes, and I could not help observing by what trifles lives were lost or saved. Had the axe not been fortunately at the capstan, I should not have been able to cut the jaw rope. Swinburne would not have had time, and the main boom. Would have gone down with the schooner. Fortunately, we had cleared it. The schooner filled, righted a little, and then sank, dragging us and the main boom for a few seconds down in its vortex, and then we rose to the surface. The squall still continued, but the water was smooth. It soon passed over, and again it was nearly calm. I counted the men. Clinging to the boom, and found that they were all there. Swinburne was next to me. He was holding with one hand, while with the other he felt in his pocket for his quid of tobacco, which he thrust into his cheek. I wasn't on deck at the time, Mr. Simple, said he, or this wouldn't have happened. 
I had just been relieved, and I told Collins to look out sharp for squalls. I only mentioned it that if you are saved, and I am not, you mayn't think that I was neglectful of my duty. We ain't far from the land, but still we are more likely to fall in with a shark than a friend, I'm thinking. This indeed had been my thoughts, but I had concealed them. But after Swinburne had mentioned the shark, I very often looked along the water for their fins, and down below to see if they were coming up to tear us to pieces. It was a dreadful feeling. It was not your fault, Swinburne, I am sure. I ought to have relieved you myself, but I kept the first watch and was tired. We must put our trust in God. Perhaps we may yet be spared. It was now almost calm, and the sun had mounted in the heavens, and scorching rays were intolerable upon our heads, for we had not the defense of hats. I felt my brain on fire, and was inclined to drop into the water to screen myself from the intolerable heat. As the day advanced, so did our sufferings increase. It was a dead calm, the sun perpendicular over us, actually burning that part of our bodies which rose clear of the water. I could have welcomed even a shark to relieve me of my torment, but I thought of Celeste, and I clung to life. Towards the afternoon, I felt sick and dizzy. My resolution failed me. My vision was imperfect. But I was roused by Swinburne, who cried out, A boat! By all this gracious! Hang on a little longer, my men, and you are saved. It was a boat full of negroes who had come out to catch flying fish. They had perceived the spar on the water, and hastened to secure the prize. They dragged us all in, gave us water, which appeared like nectar, and restored us to our fleeting senses. They made fast the boom, and towed it in shore. We had not been ten minutes on our way, when Swinburne pointed to the fin of a large shark above the water. Look there, Mr. Simple, I shuddered, and made no answer. I thanked God in my heart. In two hours we were landed, but too ill to walk. We were carried up to the hospital, bled, and put into cots. I had a brain fever which lasted six or seven days, during which O'Brien never left my bedside. My head was shaved all the skin came off my face like a mask as well as off my back and shoulders we were put into baths of brandy and water and in three weeks we were all recovered wet was but an unlucky schooner from beginning to end observed o'brien after i had narrated the events of my cruise we had a bad beginning with her and we had a bad ending. She's gone to the bottom, and the devil go with her. However, all's well that ends well. And, Peter, you're worth a dozen dead men yet, but you occasion me a great deal of trouble and anxiety. That's the truth of it, and I doubt if I shall ever rear you after all. I return to my duty on board of the brig, which was now nearly ready for sea. One morning O'Brien came on board and said, Peter, I've got a piece of news for you. Our gunner is appointed to the Araxis, and the admiral has given me a gunner's warrant for old Swinburne. Send for him on deck. Swinburne was summoned and came rolling up the hatchway. Swinburne! said o'brien you have done your duty well and you are now gunner of the rattlesnake 
Here is your warrant, and I have great pleasure in getting it for you. Swinburne turned to the quid in his cheek, and then replied, May I be so bold as to ax Captain O'Brien, whether I must wear one of them long tog swallowtail coats? Because if so, I'd prefer being a quartermaster. A gunner may wear a jacket, Swinburne, if he likes. When you go on shore, you may bend the swallowtail, if you please. Well, sir, then, if that's the case, I'll take the warrant, because I know it will please the old woman. So saying, Swinburne hitched up his trousers and went down below. I may here observe that Swinburne kept to his round jacket until our arrival in england when the old woman his wife who thought her dignity at stake soon made him ship the swallowtail and after it was once on swinburne took a fancy to it himself and always wore it except when he was at sea the same evening as i was coming with o'brien from the governor's house where i had dined we passed a building, lighted up. What can that be, observed O'Brien? Not a dignity ball. There's no music. Our curiosity induced us to enter, and we found it to be fitted up as a temporary chapel, filled with black and colored people who were ranged on the forms and waiting for the preacher. It is a Methodist meeting, said I to O'Brien. Never mind, said he. Let us hear what's going on. In a moment afterwards, the pulpit was filled, not by a white man, as we had anticipated, but by a tall negro. He was dressed in black, and his hair, which was impossible to comb down straight, was pleated into fifty little tails with lead tied at the end of them like you sometimes see the mane of a horse this produced a somewhat more clerical appearance his throat was open and collar laid back the wristbands of his shirt very large and white and he flourished a white cambric handkerchief what a dandy he is whispered O'Brien. I thought it almost too absurd when he said he would take the liberty to praise God in the seventeenth hymn and beg all the company to join chorus. He then gave out the stanzas of the most strange pronunciation. Gentle Jesus, God um love, etc., when the hymn was finished, which was sung by the whole congregation, in most delightful discord, for every one chose his own key, he gave an extempore prayer, which was most unfortunately incomprehensible, and then commenced his discord, which was on faith. I shall admit the head and front of his offending, which would, perhaps hardly be gratifying although ludicrous he reminded me of a monkey imitating a man but what amused me most was his finale in which he told his audience that there could be no faith without charity for a little while he descanted upon this generally and at last became personal his words were, as well as I can recollect, nearly as follows. And now you see, my dear brethren, how impossible to go to heaven without all the faith in the world, without charity. Charity mean give away. Suppose you no give. You no ab charity. Suppose you no ab charity. You know ab faith. Suppose you know ab faith. You all go to hell and be damned. Now, den, let me see if you ab charity. 
here you see i come to save all your soul from hellfire and hellfire damn hot i can tell you dare you all burn like coal till you turn white powder and then burn on till you come black again and so you go on burn burn sometimes white sometimes black for ever and ever the devil never allow sangaree to cool tongue no no coconut milk not a lily drop of water devil see you damned first suppose you ask he poke um fire and laugh well den ab you charity no you ab not you quashi how you dare look me in the face you keep shop you sell egg you sell yam you sell pepper hot but when you give to me eh never so help me god suppose you no send you no ab charity and you go to hell you black sambo continued he pointing to a man in a corner ab very fine boat go out all day catch fly fish bring em back fry em and sell for money but when you send to me not one little fish ever find way to my mouth what i tell you about peter and postles all fishermen good men give way to poor sambo you know ab charity and s'pose you no know, repent this week and send one very fine fish and plantain leaf you go to hell and burn for ever and ever eh so you will run away massa johnson cried he out to another who was edging to the door but you no run away from hellfire when debil catch you he hold damn tight you know you kill sheep and goat every day you send a bell ring all bout town for people to come by but when you send to me never cept once you gave me little bit of liver that no do massa johnson you no ab charity and suppose you no send me sheep's head to-morrow morning damn you liver that's all i see many more but i see em all very sorry and dat they mean to sin no more so dis time i let em off and say nothing about it because i know plenty of plantain and banana pointing to one and oranges and shaddock pointing to another and salt fish pointing to a third and ginger pop and spruce beer pointing to a fourth and a straw hat pointing to a fifth and everything else come to my house to-morrow so i say no more about it i see you all very sorry you only forget you all ab charity and all ab faith so now my dear brethren we go down on our knees and we thank god for all this and more especially that i save all your souls from going to the devil who run about barbados like one roaring lion seeking what he may lay hold of and cram into his damn fiery jaw that will do peter said o'brien we have the cream of it i think we left the house and walked down to the boat. Surely, O'Brien, said I, this should not be permitted. He's no worse than his neighbors, replied O'Brien, and perhaps does less harm. I admired the rascal's ingenuity. He gave his flock what, in Ireland, we should call a pretty broad hint. Yes, there was no mistaking him but is he a licensed preacher very little license in his preaching i take it no i suppose he had a call a call what do you mean 
I mean that he wants to fill his belly. Hunger is a call of nature, Peter. He seems to want a good many things, if we were to judge by his catalogue. What a pity it is that these poor people are not better instructed. That they never will be, Peter, while there is what may be called free trade in religion. You speak like a Catholic, O'Brien. I am one, replied he, and here our conversation ended, for we were close to the boat which was waiting for us on the beach. The next day a man-of-war brig arrived from England, bringing letters for the squadron on the station. I had two from my sister, Ellen, which made me very uncomfortable. She stated that my father had seen my uncle, Lord Privilege, and had had high words with him. Indeed, as far as she could ascertain the facts, my father had struck my uncle and had been turned out of the house by the servants, that he had returned in a state of great excitement and had been ill ever since, that there was a great deal of talk in the neighborhood on the subject people generally highly blamed my father's conduct and thinking that he was deranged in his intellect a supposition very much encouraged by my uncle she again expressed her hopes of my speedy return i had now been absent nearly three years and she had been so uncomfortable that she felt as if it had been at least ten o'brien also received a letter from father mcgrath which i shall lay before the reader my dear son long life and all the blessings of all the saints be upon you now and for evermore amen and may you live to be married and may i dance at your wedding and may you never want children, and may they grow up as handsome as their father and their mother, whoever she may hereafter be, and may you die of a good old age, and in the true faith, and be waked handsomely as your old father was last Friday's night, seeing as how he took it into his head to leave this world for a better it was a very decent funeral procession my dear terence and your father must have been delighted to see himself so well attended no man ever made a more handsome corpse considering how old and thin and haggard he had grown of late and how gray his hair had turned he held the nosegay between his fingers across his breast as natural as life and reminded us all of the blessed saint pope gregory who was called to glory some hundred years before either you or i was born your mother's quite comfortable and there she sits in the old chair rocking to and fro all day long and never speaking a word to nobody thinking about heaven i dare say which is just what she ought to do seeing that she stands a very pretty chance of going there in the course of a month or so divil a word she has ever said since your father's departure but then she screamed and yelled enough to last for seven years at the least she screamed away all her senses anyhow for she has done nothing since but cough cough and fumble at her paternosters a very blessed way to pass the remainder of her days seeing that i expect her to drop every minute like an overripe sleepy pear so don't think any more about her my son for without you are back in a jiffy her body will be laid in consecrated ground and her happy blessed soul in purgatory pax vobiscum 
amen amen and now having disposed of your father and your mother's so much to your satisfaction i'll just tell you that ella's mother died in the convent at dieppe but whether she kept her secret or not i do not know but this i do know that if she didn't relieve her soul by confession she's damned to all eternity thanks be to god for all his mercies amen ella flanagan is still alive and for a nun is as well as can be expected i find that she knows nothing at all about the matter of the exchanging the genders of the babies only that her mother was on oath to father o'toole who ought to be hanged drawn and quartered instead of those poor fellows whom the government called rebels but who were no more rebels than father mcgrath himself who will uphold the pretender as they call our true catholic king as long as there's life in his body or a drop of whisky left in old ireland to drink his health with talking about father o'toole puts me in mind that the bishop has not yet decided our little bit of dispute saying that he must take time to think about it now considering that it's just three years since the row took place the old gentleman must be a very slow thinker not to have found out by this time that i was in the right and that father o'toole the best is not good enough to be hanged your two married sisters are steady and diligent young women having each made three children since you last saw them fine boys every mother's son of them with elegant spacious features and famous mouths for taking in whole potatoes by the powers but the effects of the tree of the o'briens begin to make a noise in the land anyhow as you would say if you only heard them roaring for their bit of suppers and now my dear son terence to the real purport of this letter which is just to put to your soul's conscience as a dutiful son whether you ought not to send me a small matter of money to save your poor father's soul from pain and anguish for it's no joke that being in purgatory i can tell you and you wouldn't care how soon you were tripped out of it yourself i only wish you had but your little toe in it and then you'd burn with impatience to have it out again but you're a, a dutiful son so i'll say no more about it a nod's as good as a wink to a blind horse when your mother goes which with the blessing of god will be in a very little while seeing that she has only to follow her senses which are gone already i'll take upon myself to sell everything as worldly goods and chattels are of no use to dead people and i have no doubt but that what with the furniture and the two cows and the pigs and the crops in the ground there will be enough to save her soul from the flames and bury her decently into the bargain however as you are the heir at law seeing that the property is all your own i'll keep a debtor and creditor account of the whole and should there be any over i'll use it all out in masses so as to send her up to heaven by express and if there's not sufficient she must remain where she is till you come back and make up the deficiency in the meanwhile i am your loving father in faith erta mcgrath End of chapter fifty one
Chapter Fifty Two of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Fifty Two good sense in swinburne no man a hero to his valet de chambre or a prophet in his own country o'brien takes a step by strategy o'brien parts with his friend and peter's star is no longer in the ascendant o'brien was sorry for the death of his father but he could not feel as most people would have done as his father had certainly never been a father to him he was sent to sea to be got rid of and ever since he had been there had been the chief support of his family his father was very fond of whisky and not very fond of exertion he was too proud of the true milesian blood in his veins to do anything to support himself but not too proud to live upon his son's hard-earned gains for his mother o'brien felt very much she had always been kind and affectionate and was very fond of him sailors however are so estranged from their families when they have been long in their profession and so accustomed to vicissitudes that no grief for the loss of a relation lasts very long and in a week o'brien had recovered his usual spirits when a vessel brought us the intelligence that a french squadron had been seen off st domingo this put us all on the quai vive o'brien was sent for by the admiral and ordered to hasten his brig for sea with all possible dispatch as he was to proceed with dispatches to england forthwith in three days we were reported ready received our orders and at eight o'clock in the evening made sail from carlisle bay well mr swinburne said i how do you like your new situation why mr simple i like it well enough and it's not disagreeable to be an officer and sit in your own cabin but still i feel that i should get on better if i were in another ship i've been hail fellow well met with the ship's company so long that i can't top the officer over them and we can't get the duty done as smart as i could wish and then at night i find it very lonely stuck up in my cabin like a parson's clerk and nobody to talk to for the other warrants are particular and say that i'm only acting and may not be confirmed so they hold aloof i don't much like being answerable for all that lot of gunpowder it's queer stuff to handle very true swinburne but still if there were no responsibility we should require no officers you recollect that you are now provided for for life and will have half pay that's what made me bite mr simple i thought of the old woman and how comfortable it would make her in her old age and so do you see i sacrificed myself how long have you been married swinburne ever since christmas ninety four i wasn't going to be hooked carelessly so i nibbled afore i took the bait had four years trial of her first and finding that she had plenty of ballast i sailed her as my own how do you mean plenty of ballast i don't mean mr simple a broad bow and square hulk you know very well that if a vessel has not ballast she's bottom up in no time now what keeps a woman 
stiff under her canvas is her modesty very true swinburne but it's a rare commodity on the beach and why mr simple because liquor is more valued many a good man has found it to be his bane and as for a woman when once she takes to it she's like a ship without a rudder and goes right before the wind to the devil not that i think a man ought not to take a nor'wester or two when he can get them rum was not given by god almighty only to make the niggers dance but to make all our hearts glad neither do i see why a woman is to stand out neither what's good for jack can't hurt paul only there is a medium as they say in all things and half and half is quite strong enough i should think it was replied i laughing but don't be letting me prevent you from keeping a lookout mr simple you hoskins you're half a point off the wind luff you may i think mr simple that captain o'brien didn't pick out the best man when he made tom alsop a quartermaster in my place why he's a very steady good man swinburne yes so he is but he has natural defects which shouldn't be overlooked i was not aware of that no but i was alsop wants to sarve out his time for his pension and when he is sarved you see if when the surgeons examine him they don't invalidate him as blind as a bat i should like to have him as gunner's mate and that's just what he's fit for but mr simple i think we shall have some bad weather the moon looks greasy and the stars want snuffin you'll have two reefs in the hopsels afore morning there's five bells striking now i'll turn in if i didn't keep half the first and half the morning watch i shouldn't sleep all the night i miss my regular watch very much mr semple habits everything and i don't much fancy a standing bed place it's so large and i feel so cold on my sides nothing like a hammock after all good night mr simple good night swinburne our orders were to proceed with all possible dispatch and o'brien carried on day and night generally remaining up himself till one or two o'clock in the morning we had very favorable weather and in a little more than a month we passed the lizard the wind being fair we passed plymouth ran up channel and anchored at spithead after calling upon the admiral o'brien set off for town with his dispatches and left me in command of the ship in three days i received a letter from him informing me that he had seen the first lord who would ask him a great many questions concerning the station he had quitted that he had also complimented o'brien on his services on that hint i spake continued o'brien i ventured to insinuate to his lordship that i had hoped that i had earned my promotion and as there is nothing like quartering on the enemy i observed that i had not applied to lord privilege as i considered my services would have been sufficient without any application on his part his lordship returned a very gracious answer said that my lord privilege was a great ally of his and very friendly to the government and inquired when i was going to see him i replied that i certainly should not pay my respects to his lordship at present unless there was occasion for it as i must take a more favorable opportunity so i hope that good may come from the great lord's error which of course i shall not correct as i feel i deserve my promotion and you know peter if you can't gain it by hook 
you must by crook he then concluded his letter but there was a postscript as follows wish me joy my dear peter i have this moment received a letter from the private secretary to say that i am posted to the and appointed to the Semiramis frigate about to set sail for the east indies she is all ready to start and now i must try and get you with me of which i have no doubt as although her officers have been long appointed there will be little difficulty of success when i mention your relationship to lord privilege and while they remain in error as to his taking an interest on my behalf i sincerely rejoiced at o'brien's good fortune his promotion i had considered certain as his services had entitled him to it but the command of so fine a frigate must have been given upon the supposition that it would be agreeable to my uncle who was not only a prime supporter but a very useful member of the tory government i could not help laughing to myself at the idea of o'brien obtaining his wishes from the influence of a person who probably detested him as much as one man could detest another and i impatiently waited for o'brien's next letter by which i hoped to find myself appointed to the semiramis but a sad contretemps took place o'brien did not write but came down two days afterwards hastened on board the semiramis read his commission and assumed the command before even he had seen me he then sent his gig on board of the rattlesnake to desire me to come to him directly i did so and we went down into the cabin of the frigate peter said he i was obliged to hasten down and read myself captain of this ship as i am in fear that things are not going on well i had called to pay my respects at the admiralty previous to joining and was kicking my heels in the waiting-room when who should walk up the passage as if he were a captain on his own quarter-deck but your uncle lord privilege his eye met mine he recognized me immediately and if it did not flash fire it did something very like it he asked a few questions of one of the porters and was giving his card when my name was called for i passed him and up i went to the first lord thanked him for the frigate and having received a great many compliments upon my exertions on the west india station made my bow and retired i had intended to have requested your appointment but i knew that your name would bring up lord privileges and moreover your uncle's card was brought up and laid upon the table while i was sitting there the first lord i presume thought that his lordship was come to thank him for his kindness to me which only made him more civil i made my bow and went down and met the eye of lord privilege who looked daggers at me as he walked upstairs for of course he was admitted immediately after my audience was finished instead of waiting to hear the result of the explanation i took a post-chaise and have come down here as fast as four horses can bring me and have read myself in for peter i feel sure that if not on board my commission will be cancelled and i know that if once in command as i am now i can call for a court-martial to clear my character if i am superseded i know that the admiralty can do anything but still they will be cautious in departing from the rules of the service to please even lord privilege 
i looked up at the sky as soon as i left the admiralty portico and was glad to see that the weather was so thick and the telegraph not at work or i might have been too late now i'll go on shore and report myself to the admiral as having taken command of the Semiramis. o'brien went on shore to report himself was well received by the admiral who informed him that if he had any arrangements to make he could not be too soon as he should not be surprised if his sailing orders came down the next morning this was very annoying as i could not see how i should be able to join o'brien's ship even if i could effect an exchange in so short a time i therefore hastened on board of the semiramis and applied to the officers to know if any of them were willing to exchange into the rattlesnake but although they did not much like going to the east indies they would not exchange into a brig and i returned disappointed the next morning the admiral sent for o'brien and told him confidentially for he was the same admiral who had received o'brien when he escaped from prison with me and was very kind to him that there was some hitch about his having the semiramis and that orders had come down to pay her off all standing and examine her bottom if captain o'brien had not joined her do you understand what this means said the admiral who was anxious to know the reason o'brien answered frankly that lord privilege by whose interest he had obtained his former command was displeased with him and that as he saw him go up to the first lord after his own audience he had no doubt but that his lordship had said something to his disadvantage as he was a very vindictive man well said the admiral it's lucky that you have taken the command as they cannot well displace you or send her into dock without a survey and upon your representation and so it proved the first lord when he found that o'brien had joined took no further steps but allowed the frigate to proceed to her intended destination but all chance of my sailing with him was done away and now for the first time i had to part with o'brien i remained with him the whole time that i could be spared from my duties o'brien was very much annoyed but there was no help never mind peter said he i've been thinking that perhaps it's all for the best you will see more of the world and be no longer in leading strings you are now a fine man grown up big enough and ugly enough as they say to take care of yourself we shall meet again and if we don't why then god bless you my boy and don't forget o'brien three days afterwards o'brien's orders came down i accompanied him on board and it was not until the ship was under way and running toward the needles with a fair wind that i shook hands with him and shoved off parting with o'brien was a heavy blow to me but i little knew how much i was to suffer before i saw him again End of chapter 52